Hi, and welcome to this Microsoft Virtual Academy course on developing Microsoft SQL Server databases. My name is Graham Malcolm. Um, I'm a senior content developer at Microsoft, and I'm responsible for the data platform content, both in the MVA and the, the classroom-based uh, training that we deliver through our CPLS channel. Uh, before I joined Microsoft, I was a consultant and a trainer uh, and an author on, on various data platform technologies, particularly SQL Server. Uh, but I'm not the expert in the room today. I'm joined today by Christian Bolton. Uh, Christian, can I just ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Graeme. You're very kind. Uh, my name is Christian Bolton. I work for a company called Coeo. We're based in the UK and we deliver consulting and managed services um, around the Microsoft data platform. Um, I have a number of certifications, a Microsoft Certified Architect, Master, uh, and an MCT. I also spent uh, six years as, as a SQL Server MVP, um, and I've written a number of books around uh, internals of SQL Server and, and troubleshooting. Fantastic. Thank you. So it sounds like we're in good hands. Uh, what are we going to do today? Well, um, we, we've got a number of topics that we want to get through in this course today. Uh, there are six modules each one available um, as a separate video for you to watch. So I suggest you, you watch them in order uh, and perhaps take a little bit of time to reflect between each, each module to, uh, to make sure you've absorbed everything. We're going to start with a, a discussion of tables and views and how we might uh, think about implementing those in a database, kind of fundamental building blocks. Uh, then we'll get on to indexes. Uh, store procedures and functions follow that. Then we'll get into uh, transactions and how we manage to, to maintain atomic data within our database. We'll talk a little bit about the, the newer in-memory technologies that are available in SQL Server 2014. And then we'll wrap up with a, a module on optimizing and, and troubleshooting. So there's a, a, a lot of uh, ground to cover today. Uh, and hopefully a lot of that will be uh, useful to you. And, and why will it be useful to you? Well, because what we're trying to do is to, first of all, help people who want to, to implement databases. So if, if you're out there and you're um, perhaps in your, your job role, you're, you're a developer or you're a database professional and you need to, to implement a database for an application, um, hopefully you'll get a lot of good guidance and tips in this, this class to help you. The other uh, reason that we wanted to, to create this course is for people who are pursuing certification and in particular if you're preparing for the, um, the equivalent exam to this course, the uh, Implementing uh, SQL Server Databases exam, uh, then we wanted to provide you with some, some information to help you do that. Now, I, I would suggest to you, don't watch this video this morning and then go and do the exam this afternoon because we're not in the course of even, even within the six modules we've got, we're not going to be able to cover everything you would need to know to pass the exam. Um, but hopefully we can bring out some of the, the kind of key points for you to think about and point you off and reference some other material that you can use to help you prepare. Uh, and some of that other material to help you uh, as you um, either prepare for the exam or as you, you, you learn to use SQL Server, we've listed on the slide here, there's some suggested uh, supporting material. We have classroom-based uh, training, Microsoft Official Curriculum, or MOC as it's, it's called, courses. Uh, you can attend a MOC course at your local CPLS. And we have uh, Microsoft certified trainers throughout the world who are trained and who are experts in delivering content in a more relaxed, longer term type engagement in a classroom with other students where you can uh, study and learn. So that's a really good option if, if you learn best in a, in a classroom with an instructor. If you want to learn online, if you want to um, do this as a more self-paced thing, there are lots of other courses on the, on the MVA. So I suggest you uh, have a look on the, the Microsoft Virtual Academy site. You can filter by technology. If you filter by SQL Server, uh, you, you'll see there's a whole bunch of courses there. The other thing I would suggest you do, just uh, flicking onto a, another slide here, um, SQL Server, if, if you've been working with SQL Server for any, any length of time at all, you probably already know this, but if, if you haven't or if you're new to the, to the platform, SQL Server Books Online, or BOL, you'll sometimes see it referred to, is the definitive product documentation for the product. And it's, um, it's not just documentation in terms of how to use the product, there's guidance and information in there about how to, how to get best use out of it. Um, it's available online on both the TechNet and MSDN websites, and you can download a local version. When you install SQL Server, you can install the documentation locally. I do suggest that you, you use the online version where possible because obviously it gets updated and, and the latest and greatest information will be there. Just to kind of show you what it looks like, I'm just going to flick around. Here's the... Uh, the uh, TechNet version of the site. You can see if you look in the TechNet library and uh, 
drill down into the product documentation, you'll find books online for SQL Server 2014, and there's the equivalent for other versions as well that you can go to. And if you're uh, not a TechNet aficionado, if you're more on the developer side of things, the same thing is on the MSDN website as well. So you'll, you'll find exactly the same structure uh, and the same documentation there. So I, I do suggest you check that out. OK, just returning to the slides. Um, if I can get to the right window, there we go. Um, so that's the documentation. I, I do suggest you use that to supplement whatever training or whatever learning you're doing. Uh, there's, there's lots of great information there. And every developer in SQL Server, when they get stuck with the syntax, that's the first place you go. You look in books online. Um, you're on the MVA. This, that's currently where you are, just in case you weren't paying attention. You're on the MVA website, and you're currently viewing this course. Um, the Virtual Academy is more than just a, a collection of, of videos. I, I do suggest you participate in the community, sign up there. Uh, you, you can um, build up a collection of points and, and you know, in, interact with the community there uh, and, and learn an awful lot from, from the various different courses that are in the MVA. So I do suggest uh, keep coming back. There's going to be lots and lots of new courses appearing. Uh, and as, as new versions of technologies come along, we'll be publishing training as, as quickly as we can. So it's a great place to, to stay up to date. So that's the introductions. We're ready to jump straight into the first module. And what we're going to do is um, talk a little bit about implementing tables and views. And I'm going to hand over to Christian, because he's the expert. So Christian, take it away and tell us what we're going to be talking about in this module. Great. Thanks, Graeme. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate the fact, first of all, that the, the aim of this course and this module was really to, to help you prepare towards uh, the developing Microsoft SQL Server uh, databases exam. Um, it's not completely self-contained in terms of it providing everything that you would need to take the course. But what we've done uh, in developing the materials uh, and the plan for, for these modules is really to pick out the areas that, that we feel as, as trainers that can be confusing sometimes for people um, and also areas of, of specific interest that may be harder for you to study for on your own that you may get um, more kind of support with through, through demos and, and discussions throughout the day. So we'll first start talking about uh, tables, schemas and views. Then we're going to have a discussion around temporary tables and table variables. So these are uh, programming constructs, um, if you like, that are often uh, cause for, for much debate. Um, and we'll compare and contrast how they're used um, in, in that part of the module. And then we're going to talk about common table expressions is something that will be um, uh, it is definitely part of the exam um, syllabus, if you like. And we'll talk about that and some demos of that uh, before talking about table partitioning, which again is another really important part of, of, of the syllabus for the exam uh, and is often misunderstood and overlooked and be quite difficult if you're studying on your own to, to grasp some of those, those concepts. Sounds good. So there's a, a lot to cover. Let's, yes. uh, let's dive in and talk a little bit about designing tables. Sure. So, the, I mean, the topic of designing tables itself, we could talk about for, for many, many days. So what I wanted to do, first of all, is have this kind of introduction and reminder for those of you that have been working with SQL Server for a while. Um, and we'll talk about some, uh, some discussion points and, and things that you should bear in mind. And the first one there um, is really to avoid table names and column names that contain spaces, keywords, and symbols. And this is um, really to help SQL Server and to aid your development, where you can use some of these, uh, but you have to put them in square brackets to tell SQL Server not to treat them as, as keywords. But so as a best practice, it's really good to, to keep object names simple. So I should probably avoid um, th things like, uh, I, I guess, data type name. So don't have a column called date or date yes. time because that's yeah. the name of a, a data type. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Or a table called table. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. good well. point. If, I guess if I was running a furniture store, I might have a table called <laughs> table or something like that. Yeah, okay. Uh, so good tip. What else? Uh, so the next one is to plan data types for each column. So your data types really control the type of data that you can have uh, within the column, within your table. But it's not just as simple as saying, I want numbers to go into this column. So if you were representing a number, you might use the integer data type. But we have a tiny int, we have a big int, we have the integer data type. Um, and they allow for different sizes. So it's important that you plan not just for what you think you need, uh, but your kind of capacity and growth expectations around the, the data types and use those appropriately. 
And I, I guess as well, we, we, we talked about numerical data types and, and getting the size of the, the integer right. Um, I, I guess with, with strings or with, with text data, you want to think about whether it's a fixed length or a variable length and, and, and consider that as yes, well. Yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So the next one is, is planning to uh, whether to allow nulls. So a null is the absence of any data rather than being zero. Uh, and what's um, interesting about nulls or what you need to bear in mind is that you can't do calculations on nulls. So we kind of have to handle them a little bit differently uh, within the code. Um, so it's a good idea to try and avoid nulls, but there are a lot of situations and you know, there'll be debates around mm. designing tables and, and schemas. So for example, it'd be quite easy to not allow null on, um, on a, somebody's age, for example, because everybody has an age. But if you were storing a record of a person and you didn't know what their date of birth was, um, it may be more appropriate to have a null value and an absence of a value than make up something like I don't know, 1st of January 1900 or something, in the absence of data. So it's important that you plan for your use of nulls um, and try and avoid them uh, if it's appropriate because it will make, uh, make your life easier. Sure, and, and the, the thing I quite often uh, point out about nulls is, it, to a certain extent, null means we don't know what the value here is. Yeah. And um, one of the things you'll find as, you, as you're developing a database, if you have got nulls in, in the database, it makes checking for equality very difficult. You know, f find people who have the same last name. Well, is that unknown last name the same as that unknown yeah. last name? Well, we don't know because we don't know what the last names are. So, uh, yeah, you have to be pretty careful about deciding whether, when it's appropriate to use nulls. Yeah, and exactly. Not. And that's the important thing. It's not sufficient to say, um, I'm not going to allow nulls on everything uh, generally because there are situations where it's better to have a null rather than to make up a value. Mm. Okay. So the next one is really around planning your primary key and foreign key constraints. And again, this is an area that we could talk about for, for several hours, but primary keys and foreign keys are how SQL Server helps you to maintain the referential integrity um, of, your, of your data. And by that, um, I mean, we'll, we'll have a look in a demo shortly, but we're talking about um, grouping together related data like um, uh, customers and orders and order details. Um, we'll have a look at more detail um, uh, in the demo coming up around that. Fantastic. Um, and the final one is really around planning indexes to optimize performance. So again, indexing um, is coming up in the next module. We'll talk about it in, in a bit more depth, but it's definitely a really important area when you're thinking about designing your tables is how you're going to be accessing those tables and what appropriate indexes would be uh, to improve the performance on those tables. Great. And, and as you say, there's a whole module on indexing yes. coming up. Yeah. But when you're creating a table at that point, you may initially think about, well, I want to have an index on, say, the primary key column or a column that's frequently searched. Or exactly, whatever. yeah. So it's important to bear it in mind right at the beginning. Great, OK, brilliant. Well, with that, the, you'll see quite a few of these slides today. We're, we're going to try and uh, show you as much of this stuff as we can. So it's a, a, a demo that we're going to jump to. And with that, we'll switch across to, to Christian's machine, and he can show you how this works. Great. Thanks, Graham. Um, so in this demo, first of all, we're going to create a new database called DemoDB just to provide uh, a new context for the setup. Then we're going to use DemoDB. So the first statement we're going to look at is this create table. So we're going to create a table called customer. So this is within a schema called DBO, and we're going to talk about schemas in the next section. And within this customer table, uh, we first of all got a, a column called customer ID, which we can see has a data type of integer, which we use int for short, but it's also been set as an identity column. So this means that we're not going to have to su supply a value for this. Um, SQL Server is automatically going to generate a value as we insert this, um, and we'll use this for identifying the rows. And the, the identity, I see you've got one one there, so it's going to start at one and go up in, in, yes. in one. Yeah, okay. exactly. And we'll also specify this as a primary key, um, and then we're going to create another table to reference that primary key. Okay. 
So the other column we have here is customer name, and that has a, a data type of nvarchar or nvarcar, and this basically means we have a variable length um, character field of up to 50 characters. Now the n means that we can store Unicode data, so uh, uh, characters from from um, other languages, basically special characters. So kanji characters or, or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. And, and there's a var car equivalent, which is just your straightforward ASCII values. Yeah. yeah. So so the the way to think about n n var car is that uh, it's twice as uh, much to store um, Unicode data, so nvarcar as it is to store varcar. Um, but if you're looking at international data sets, um, or you don't know if you're going to involve international data sets, particularly with names and, and different characters within names, um, it's better to err on the side of using uh, Unicode okay. data types. We're also specifying customer name as not null. Remember, we talked about we just talked about not null because there's no point having a record uh, that for a customer that doesn't have a customer name. So let's go ahead and create that table. And just while while you're you're creating that, mm -hmm. just to kind of point out, this is a fairly simple demo. We've got customer name there, so we, we've obviously got the entire customer name first and last in the yeah. one column. In reality, that that's not how we would design a database. Yes, yeah, correct. It's fine for the purposes of a demo, obviously, but there's a whole domain around this called normalization. And if we were to design this table to third normal form, we would separate out customer name because it's multiple values within a single column. Um, and we don't want to do that uh, if we're designing to third normal form. So I would definitely encourage you to, to go and have a look at the topic of normalization and particularly with third normal form, which is what we tend to, to design tables to. So if, you, if you're preparing for the exam, then you know clearly a little bit about understanding how you would normalize the scheme of a database to separate out your data into multiple yeah, tables and exactly. columns. exactly. And you can imagine a very fair exam question asking you to, to normalize a schema design. So you need to be familiar with, uh, with what that means. OK, fantastic. So this uh, next statement here, we're going to insert um, some values into the customer table. So this insert statement, you notice that I'm specifying two values in here, two customer names. I'm not having to specify a customer ID because it's an identity column. You remember I mentioned that uh, SQL Server will automatically generate those values for us. So I guess what's interesting about the insert statement is, you know, a lot of the time you're used to seeing an insert statement that just inserts one row. Yeah. In this case, we're, we're using one insert statement to insert two rows. Each of those rows in the table will actually have two values, but because one of them is an identity, we don't have to yes, explicitly correct. specify. Yeah. Right. So then the next table we're creating here is a customer order table. So let's have a look at that. So we're creating another ID column. Um, and for this, I, this is also an identity column, uh, and we're starting that from uh, 1 million and 1, and mm. we'll increase that by 1. Uh, this is also the primary key. Okay. Um, we're also creating a customer ID column. You remember we have a customer ID in the customer table as well up here. Yep. Um, and what we're saying is that this customer ID column is a foreign key that references the customer table we've just created based on customer ID. So we're creating a relationship between this value in this table and customer ID in the customer table. And I guess I, I mean I guess it's worth pointing out that's a kind of key, if you pardon the pun, mm -hmm. it's a core part of, of database design. The reason it's a Absolutely. relational database is because we have multiple tables, yeah. which sometimes we call relations and the relationships between them, yeah? Yeah, so, and this is where we use uh, primary keys and foreign keys to help, uh, to ask SQL Server effectively to help us maintain referential integrity. So this is the term, when we talk about primary keys and foreign keys, is referential integrity. Uh, if you want to kind of follow that up and, and really understand what, what we mm. mean by that. Um, and you could maintain referen referential integrity yourself, uh, in the application layer, you mm. could enforce the data structures there, but um, it's much easier generally to get SQL Server to handle that for you. Okay. Um, and we're also creating um, another column here called order amount, which has a decimal data type, which is going to allow for 18, um, 18 numbers um, and then two uh, numbers after a decimal point. 
Oh, so you're expecting fairly big orders then? Oh, hopefully. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm betting on the future. <laughs> okay, so that was created successfully. So now if we have a look at our uh, customer table, so we have those two names that we created, automatically generated customer IDs. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to create, uh, insert some values into my customer orders table. Okay. So if you if we look back at the structure of that table, remember we've got customer order ID, so we're not specifying a value for that because it's an identity, identity column. Okay. Um, then we've got to specify a customer ID, so this is the first value here, um, and then the order amount. Okay. So I'm creating two orders, one for customer one and one for customer two. And if, if I wanted to insert a, a, an order ID, if I had a specific order ID I wanted to insert, it, can I override the, the identity? Is there a way of doing that? Um, I don't know, actually. Can you enforce I, you that? Can, you can set identity off. Yes, yeah. yes, correct. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so that's a way for controlling if you're removing data yeah. and, and adding data later on, you could override that insert. Right. Uh, yeah. But you need to be very careful about what's being created. Absolutely, yeah. So where do we get to to reinsert these? Oh, I've we've, inserted we've doubled up because I distracted yeah, you, but that's there you okay. Go. That's no, fine. no, no, that's fine. So we've got some extra orders here. So now I'm going to insert um, another row in here. I'm going to try to, but you notice this is custom ID of three, which we haven't created. Okay. So this is giving us this error message because we're in violation of the foreign key constraint. So what we've specified is because we have a foreign key back to the primary key on the customer table, I can't have orders that aren't referenced to a customer, which is valid in this kind mm. of business scenario. So, and, and you didn't explicitly create a foreign key with that name, it's generated that yes, it's, it's kind exactly. of weird name there. It's yeah. automatically generated that, that name there. Okay. Um, so the next uh, part of the demo, so we're going to try and delete a customer. So we've got customer ID one, which we know we've created. Um, they've asked to be removed from our mailing list. They're not interested in, in, in having, you know, being a customer anymore. Okay. Um, sorry, scroll down there. Uh, but what it's telling me is that, again, I'm in violation of this foreign key constraint. Um, that's because the customer that we're trying to remove still has orders in the orders table. So, and if we were able to remove this customer, we'd have some orphaned orders that we couldn't track back okay. to work out um, who, who ordered them. And, and just to be clear, it's, it's not just because there, there is a foreign key constraint. If, if the customer didn't have any orders, then there wouldn't be a problem. We could delete Correct. them. Correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's because there's a relationship with data in the other table. I see. So what we're going to do uh, in this next part, we're going to alter table. Uh, we're going to alter table customer order. We're going to drop the constraint. So the foreign key that we created when we defined the table, we refer to as a constraint because okay. it constrains the data that can go into that column. Um, I took a copy of that foreign key name that was automatically generated. Okay, this is the issue when it automatically generates the name. You yes, don't know ahead of yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. So we'll drop that constraint. And then we're going to alter the customer order table again. We're going to add the constraint so we can control the, mm -hmm. the naming of that foreign key this time. Mm -hmm. So we're specifying exactly the same things, that it's a foreign key on customer ID, which references the customer table, customer ID column. But this time we're going to add an on-delete cascade. Okay. So I'll explain what that means in a minute. So now we've, we've re-added that foreign key constraint. Look at the customer orders table. So the customer orders table, we have customer ID one has two, two order. orders within this table. Mm -hmm. And if we try and delete that customer now, so we noticed it failed before, but because we've created the um, the foreign key constraint with an on delete cascade. What it means is we've removed the customer, but we've also removed the orders oh, the that were orders. associated to that customer. Okay. So this is quite a powerful um, 
option and you know with great power comes great responsibility <laughs> um, in the fact that um, if you make a mistake on that then it's going to cascade your deletes through the rest of your data um, so and in generally when we're working with applications and environments um, it's an unusual event mm. to, to remove data. So uh, we would gener generally not use on delete cascade because we're trying to mitigate any risk, basically. But True. it's a very useful feature as long as you've got the confidence that, that okay. you can control it, its use, basically. And I guess it's worth pointing out that there is an equivalent for update. We can do up updates yes. uh, cascade. Yeah. So in a slightly bizarre scenario, if I changed a customer's ID, yeah. I could then change the the matching ID in the, yes. the orders table as Correct. well, which yeah. is even less common a scenario, I yeah. guess, than deleting. Yeah. But. but, I mean, it's, it's definitely important. And again, it, when we're looking at features like this and the way that you can use the language and the constructs, um, you need to be aware of what's possible more than... You know, we're not saying this is how you should do it, mm -hmm. but certainly for for everyday use and for the purposes of the exam, you need to be aware of these these features and how you could design it for very specific scenarios. Great. Okay. Well, just just before we, we move away from the demo, okay. I did I did want to drill into one more thing, just in a little bit more depth. Could you possibly scroll back up to the, the create table statement? Because sure. You know, fundamentally, this module is about creating tables. So let's talk a little bit more about that. And there it is. Okay. Can we go for this one? Yep, that's fine. So we have this this create table statement. And it, the syntax is create table, the name mm -hmm. of the table, in, including the schema. Uh, and that's that. We'll talk about schemas later on, but it's it's worth getting into the habit, I guess, to explicitly specify the schema and the table Absolutely. name. And then for each of the uh, the different columns that we're defining in that table, we've got a name, a data type, um, and then if there's additional I guess, attributes of that column um, that we, we want to include, like this one's an identity column and it's the primary key, so we mm -hmm. specify them. Um, what what we haven't done here is explicitly said, well, where physically on the disk should this the data in this table be stored? And mm -hmm. that might be something I would want to do. I might have a table that's accessed frequently and I want to make sure it's stored on a solid state drive mm -hmm. and a table that's perhaps archived data that I, you know, I'm quite happy to store on a, a, a mechanical drive. Yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about how I manage that storage? Sure, sure. So the um, the feature within uh, SQL Server to manage that is called file groups. Okay. So if we have a look in, uh, do we have still have this? DemoDB, you probably have to refresh your list of databases, yeah. I think, in Object Explorer. There you go. So if we have a look at the properties of DemoDB, what we'll see here is that we've got uh, one of these tabs called file groups. Mm -hmm. So we have one file group called primary. So you'll always have this when you create a database. Mm -hmm. um, and this basically contains the MDF, so the master data file um, that you would have uh, for, for any database. Okay. And if you wanted to create um, additional file groups, um, we could create one called um, so should we call that fast disk? Mm -hmm. um, and then if we switch over to files, so and we wanted to add another file, let's call that um, we'll call that fast, 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 yeah, fast, sure. fast disk file. Um, and then I'm going to specify. I'm going to put this in the fast disk file group. Okay. And then um, I don't actually have any other drives on here. But essentially what I would do is to specify... Where, where that, uh, yeah, that, that... I'm going to put it on a fast yeah. drive and an SSD disk. Sure. Um, and then when I'm creating the table, I would create it on the fast disk file um, file group. And that's literally the syntax at the end of the create table statement is on and the name of the yeah, file. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and I guess, again, if you are preparing for the exam, uh, one thing to think about here, um, we're, we're not going to dive into file groups in any more depth in, in this course. I do suggest you go and look at the documentation. And one of the things you would probably want to do in a database is use that primary file group that's there by default for the system tables that the, the database uses to maintain its own yeah. metadata, but then explicitly create file groups for the data that you want to create, where you want to create your tables and make one of those the default, so that even if you don't specify Absolutely. on which uh, which, yeah. which um, 
file group, that's where it would go. So do go and look up uh, file groups in the, uh, the documentation. There's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in there. Absolutely. It's a good best practice to, to not use the primary file group. Yeah. When we look at um, recovery um, options, I think is in the, uh, the next course that we do, because mm. you can do recovery for, of specific um, files and file groups. Um, and if you've grouped everything into, into different file groups, it can allow you a bit more flexibility in how mm. to do that. OK, great. So um, let's draw attention to schemas. We saw some in, in, in the, uh, the example there, or at least we saw the DBO schema. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about schemas. So, so the idea behind schemas, first of all, uh, where we would use schemas is for a naming boundary. So, um, so it's a way for us to logically group database objects. Um, and this is where we talked about using the schema name when, when referencing objects before. And this is really important when we talk about name resolution of, um, of objects. So in theory, I mean, we, we've got the full, the fully qualified name, if you like, down there is actually this, the SQL Server instance that the thing is on, sure, the yeah. database. Usually you skip that because normally you're working within a specific database. That's the context that you're working within. But then within that, I've got schemas and objects. So I could, in theory, have a sales schema that has products in it. And I could have a production schema that also has products in exactly. it. So it's the fully qualified name. Yeah. Both parts makes it unique. Exactly. And you know, interesting areas. So this is what we call a four-part uh, name that we've got on the slide there. And um, as, as you mentioned, Graham, so we, we would normally reference a schema in the object mm -hmm. because we're in the context of a, of a database in the context of a server. So you could specify the whole thing, but, but generally we would use a schema and, and object name. And interesting areas where, where we've used this in the past or I've seen it used is uh, a development schema and a production schema hmm. is a way of having kind of naming boundaries. And if you see anything in a development schema on a production server, you knew something's gone wrong in, in, in um, moving the code from development into production environments. Good enough. So it's a way of, of providing a naming boundary of uh, it, there may be grouping around um, business functions or, or the way that you use the database or the application itself. OK, great. So, um, And the next part is uh, really around a security boundary. So we can apply specific security to schemas. So if you wanted to uh, provide access for a new user to everything within a specific schema, uh, or a, a set of tables and objects, you would put them within a schema um, and it makes it easier to be more uh, specific about the, the security and, and access that we want to provide to, to, to users. And here's an example um, at the bottom of the slide where we can use uh, grant execute command to allow somebody to execute any code that's part of the sales schema. So I, I guess in this example, if, if I had multiple store procedures in there, rather than explicitly granting execute on each individual um, store procedure, granting it on the schema, it, it then inherits that permission. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. exactly. All right, so tell me a little bit about, we, we talked about the, the naming boundaries. Tell me about how SQL Server goes about resolving cases where I don't specify the schema. Yeah, so this is a really important point. Um, a performance tuning tip is around this uh, default schema and naming resolution. So if you, uh, if I did a select star from, from table, for example, and I didn't specify the schema, what SQL Server will do is first of all, have a look at your default schema if you've got a default schema defined. Um, and if that object doesn't exist within your default schema, then we'll try the DBO schema. And uh, if it doesn't exist within the DBO schema, then we'll return an object not found. So that's fine and that's straightforward um, and easy to follow. But where we've seen this um, cause a problem, and again, and this leads on to this tip around always use this two-part naming convention of, of schema and object name, is really in scalability. Um, if you have a user in the sales schema and it is referencing an object in the DBO schema, um, it will work. 
mm -hmm. and you won't notice any different, and it's very, very fast. But you scale that up to thousands of users and thousands of transactions, all of a sudden, this extra check of, is it in the default schema? Mm -hmm. Um, no, let me check the DBO schema, can cause significant scalability issues. So it's best, no matter how small, to start with this two-part naming convention because as you scale, uh, you'll be very pleased that you started off as a best practice. I, I, I guess it's like in anything else. I always say to people who are developing anything in SQL Server, yes, there are, there's default behavior for everything, but it's best to be explicit. So when you're creating a table, depending on the way that you've configured the database, it will either allow nulls or it won't, and you don't have to specify, but it's best to be explicit. It's yes. best to be clear about what you want. And the same is true when you're you're dealing with objects. It's, it's best to be clear it's it's that object in that schema yeah. uh, that I, I want to access. Okay, great. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the, 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 the benefits and detriments to SQL Server in a lot of this. A lot of things just work. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you need to appreciate is what goes in the background to make it look like it works. Mm -hmm. So if you can be very specific about what you're asking it to do, um, you're not relying on SQL Server or giving it extra work to do to try and to, to make it work for you. Okay, great, thanks. So hey, I told you we'd see a lot of these slides. We've got another demo, and you're mm -hmm. going to show us exactly how schemas work. So let's, yeah. let's switch to the demo machine. So within uh, demo DB, I'm going to create. So we have this create schema statement here. I'm going to create a new schema called reporting. And authorization effectively is going to tell, I'm telling SQL Server um, that I want the DBO, so the database owner user within the database, to own the reporting schema. And I, I guess it's just worth pointing out. Um, Obviously, you and I have worked with SQL Server for more, more years than I care to remember. Um, but for those of you who haven't, this can be a little point of confusion. So let me, let me just pull this out. There is a schema called DBO in every database. And there is also a user called DBO in every yes. database. That's and a good point. Historically, that's because I think prior to version SQL Server 2005, objects were named after whoever owned them, whichever user owned the object. So there was always a DBO, which stands for database owner, and the DBO would own objects that, that were created by an administrator. Um, to bring this in line with, with, with more kind of standards uh, across multiple database systems, the ideas of schemas were, were introduced in um, SQL Server 2005, but obviously to, to maintain compatibility with code from, from earlier versions of SQL, we still had this notion of a user called DBO, so we created a schema called DBO so that that code would continue to work. So the potential point of confusion, and I hope I haven't confused you even more, mm -hmm. but uh, there is always a user called DBO, which is the, think of it as being about the, the administrative user for that database, it's the database owner, but there is also a matching schema called DBO. And it's useful not to get the two of them mixed it's up. It's a very good point, actually, and yeah, I can appreciate how I could have made assumptions there, because like you said, in older versions of SQL Server, before we had schemas, we still had this two-part naming conventions, but it was actually the owner of the object. Mm -hmm. And then the concept of schemas came in, which was much broader than, than the owner. It was more kind of grouping of, of objects. But to maintain backwards compatibility, yeah, we, we still have these constructs of, of DBO and these uses. Sure. So what I'm saying here is I'm creating a schema called reporting, uh, which is owned by the DBO user within the DemoDB database. Great. So I'm also going to create a schema called operations owned by DBO. But because I'm executing this as a single statement, the flights table should hopefully be within the operations schema. Okay. Good. Well, that worked. And we'll go and have a look at that now. So we can see we have uh, operations flights here, which is what we expected. So we have the flights table created in the mm -hmm. operations schema. Um, and we should also have... Under security. Oh, there we go. Thank you. The schemas. So we have the operations schema and the reporting schema that we created as a separate, mm -hmm. as a separate event. So let's drop that table. And 
and drop the operation schema. Okay. So now I'm going to execute these separately. So I'm going to create a schema called operations. Okay. Which, if we refresh that, I still have. It's still there, yeah. Yeah, operation schema. Then I'm going to create a table called flights. Okay. So if we have a look for this table again now, you notice it's been created in the DBO schema. And that's because my default schema is DBO. And that's exactly where it's gone because I didn't specify the schema to create it in. Or indeed, if you didn't have a default schema, it, it would exactly, default to DBO. Yeah. The default default, if you yeah, like. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the other interesting point that I wanted to put at the end here is this exact same table I'm going to create again in the reporting schema. And this is where you need to be careful. And it helps for you to be specific about the schema you're referring to. Mm -hmm. I have two tables in this database called flights, mm. one in the DBO schema and one in the reporting schema. So, so back to the example on the slide, if I did a select star from, well, I wouldn't do select star, I'd just select the columns I want because that's <laughs> the best practice. Uh, from flights, um, the specific flights table it would query is going to depend on whether or not my default schema is reporting or DBO or I don't have a default exactly, schema. Exactly, exactly. So you could end up getting, uh, uh, having to troubleshoot a problem where you're not seeing the data you expect. Mm. Um, and that's because you, you weren't specific about the schema that you wanted to reference. Fantastic. Thanks. And we'll move on from that demo and talk about views. So we, we've talked about tables. And I, I, I kind of get tables are where the data is stored. Tell me a little bit about views. So a view you can think about as a, a, a virtual table within the database. So um, it's, a, it's an object that's referenced in the same way as a table. So you would do select column names from uh, a view name. Okay. And, uh, and there's nothing from that query. You wouldn't know whether that was a table or a view. Um, and then when we're creating the, the view itself, um, is basically uh, you're creating a view based on a select query. So if we have a look at the code on the screen there we go. now, so we have this create view statement. We're creating, we're following best practice. We've got human resources schema here, and we're creating a view called employee list um, based on that select statement. Okay, so, um, and I'm guessing, I mean, with the select statement here, it's fairly simple. We're selecting some columns from a from one underlying table, I'm guessing I could have views that are based on multiple underlying tables. Exactly, exactly. And this is the, can, can be quite powerful with views in the fact that that select statement could have a join to bring a single result set, and then you would use that uh, as if it was a, a single table. Okay, great, thanks. So moving on to more detail around the views. So a view doesn't persist data unless you have an indexed view. So an indexed view, um, well, we'll come on to that point, actually. Um, so if you think about normal views, it doesn't persist the data. So the data doesn't exist. And when you reference that view, um, it will pull the data from the underlying tables. So that the query in the view definition is executed when I query the view. Exactly, right. in order to return to okay. turn the data to you. So another point to mention around here as well is this with schema binding option. So if you think about the scenario where you create a view that's used by your application, uh, selects a number of columns and you're um, presenting that through your application, um, if somebody removes a column from the underlying table um, that your view um, is dependent on, that view is then broken. Okay. So what we would do is to create a view with schema binding to prevent uh, schema changes to the underlying table from breaking the views that we're using. So it, it prevents changes to the, the definition of the underlying table. I can still add and delete data yes. directly at the table. Yeah, Just, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. So it, it means that the columns that I have in the view can't be removed from the underlying table because it would break the views. So okay. it's very common to use schema binding for, for important views. Okay. 
So the next point that I wanted to make here was if you add a unique clustered index, and we're going to talk about indexes in the next module, mm -hmm. um, if you add a unique clustered index to a view, um, it will make it an indexed view. And what's um, interesting for that is that it then persists the data independently. Okay, so independently of the table. Of the, of the table and the view. So the view is a virtual table, and we mentioned before that when you uh, select data from that view, it selects it from the underlying table. Mm -hmm. But if we put a clustered index on that view, it's actually going to generate a new physical table, effectively, called an indexed view. Right, OK. Oh, so there's a couple of a point there to, to talk about that. Yeah, okay. that's fine. So, so, uh, and it, so it's persisted to, a dis, to a disk in its own right to improve performance. Because if you've got to do calculations within that view, you can pre-calculate them and have them persisted on, on, on disk. Oh, so I could, for example, have an orders table that has, I don't know, the, the price and the tax and then calculate the, the total price. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. Right, okay. so, um, so an indexed view, it, it's... Again, great power comes great responsibility not to over, overdo indexed views. And, you know, there could be an argument for saying if I need an indexed view, should I really kind of, does it mean that I haven't designed my schema properly sure. if I'm having to create these new constructs? But something that's very important for you to, to remember in general and, and certainly for the exam is around this concept of an indexed view. And... Um, Enterprise Edition has a feature where the optimizer within Enterprise Edition will automatically um, use indexed views to improve the performance of other queries. So it will treat it exactly what it is as an index, and it will use an indexed view to improve the performance of other other features. Oh, okay. um, but you will only get that with Enterprise Edition features. Right. The Enterprise Edition feature. So you can imagine, you know, an exam scenario, an exam question where you have Standard Edition. You can see where it's leading you with mm. this indexed view. Um, but you don't have Enterprise Edition, so SQL Server won't automatically uh, use this indexed view to improve the performance of, of the other queries. Okay. But I, just to be clear, I can create index views in Standard Edition. Yes. It's just the optimizer doesn't. Exactly. Decide. So you can create the index views, and the application that you're creating the index view for, you would use that very successfully. But the Enterprise Edition will then use that in other areas of, of the application in SQL Server. Okay. Good enough. So, and the final point there is the inserts and updates. So, we can use views to do inserts and updates uh, to the underlying tables, okay. uh, but not if it was based on, on multiple tables. Oh, well, I guess more specifically, if it's based on multiple underlying tables, I can do an update to the view which, can, which affects only one of those tables. Yes, sorry, yeah. yes, correct, yeah. Um, but I can't, I can't, so if I had a view that showed me customers and orders combined, I couldn't do an update that changed a customer's name and changed an order at yes. the same time. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Okay. Well, you're up again. It's time for another demo. You're again, going to show us a little bit of view. So <laughs> let's, let's switch across. So in this demo, we're going to use uh, the AdventureWorks database, which is the, uh, the kind of default sample database mm -hmm. that um, you, you'll see if you've been doing lots of different training courses. And I'm going to create a new view in the person schema, which is called individuals with email, which is going to be based on this select statement. So this one is based on two underlying tables then? Yes, yeah. Right. Um, so I can execute that select statement. And basically what I'm saying when I'm creating this view is this kind of predefined select statement. So I create this view of individuals with emails. And when I query that view, that's the equivalent of me executing this select statement here. OK, so for, from the point of view of creating, I, I, I guess, a, an abstraction layer for an application, the, the application developer can write much simpler queries because the views encapsulate the, exactly. the more complex ones. Exactly. Exactly. OK. So um, so what this then enables us to do, like you said, the, the simplification of it, uh, I can do a select star from naughty me. I should have done the, yeah. uh, all, all, all the columns as we'll, best we'll, practice. We'll forgive you in there. <laughs> so I select star from um, 
uh, individuals with the email, but then I can order it by last name. So I can reorder the results, I can aggregate the results, I can do um, anything that I want with it effectively. So it is, I mean, it's, it's very, exactly the same as creating a table. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. It just makes things um, a, a bit simpler, basically. So I can also have a look at the definition of this view here. So by using um, this statement here, what I'm saying is, show me the construct of this view, which is giving me this create view statement. And I could get the same thing by going to um, the Adventure Works database. Uh, person individuals with email and I could do this script view as create is going to give me the definition that I created and the reason that I wanted to show you this was really to move on to this with encryption option okay. that you have here so essentially what this will enable you to do is to hide the definition of the view uh, to stop people scripting it out so that's, it's quite confusing terminology because just looking at that, if I didn't know any better, I would assume mm -hmm. that meant the data will be encrypted. Okay. But yeah, of course it doesn't that. mean yeah. that at all. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it's the definition mm. of the view that's encrypted here. So if I do that same um, view definition, you'll find that we actually get a null result here. So, and what you'll find is, you know, this feature um, will be used for, companies that write software for, for SQL Server that they then sell to customers and they might not want their complex IP that was written in within a view to be scriptable by other people for reuse. So they might use the with encryption keyword so they're pr protecting them themselves data. from uh, intellectual theft, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I don't see it used very often because it can make troubleshooting difficult. Sure. But certainly as a, as a feature and an option within the product, it's something that you need to be aware of. And, um, you know, if you were troubleshooting and you were trying to script this out and finding that you were getting null results, um, if you knew that there was this with encryption keyword there, it will help to put the pieces together and, and not think SQL Server is broken because I can't script mm. out this view. Okay. So again, let's drop that. Um, yeah, and we've done this one already. So if we have a look at any of these um, other ones, and this script view as um, is most often what I would use if I'm kind of troubleshooting and, and, and looking at definitions of views mm -hmm. and store procedures and anything like that. It is it's just this um, ability to script things uh, using the, the user interface in SQL Server Management Studio is one of these these features that I really love. I, I, I remember working with a guy who was a, an Exchange Server administrator and he would have killed to be able to point at things <laughs> in the Exchange UI and just script the PowerShell yes, that's required to yeah. create. So yeah, fantastic, yeah. great. That was views. Now, views we thought of as being kind of virtual tables. Now we're going to talk about something slightly different. We're going to talk about temporary tables. Temporary tables. So, so temporary tables is um, a very common and useful topic within, within SQL Server. And remember this section, we're going to compare and contrast mm -hmm. temporary tables and table variables. Okay. So let's look at temporary tables first. So temporary tables are used to hold temporary result sets within a user's session. So effectively, if you wanted to create um, a loading table um, you would put that within TempDB because uh, TempDB we would use like a scratch database. When SQL Server restarts, TempDB is effectively recreated. So all of these temporary tables um, would, would be gone. They're not kind of persisted beyond, beyond reboots. Just very much a sort of workspace. Yeah, too, right? exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. Um, so they're created in TempDB. They're deleted automatically. So um, if you create it, like we have in the example here, we have a, a hash or a, 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 is it a pound in the US? Uh, it, it, our American cousins would call that a pound symbol. A pound I would call symbol. it a hack, although hashtag has become the thing. So <laughs> it's a little confusing. So, so TMP products. So, mm -hmm. so create table hash TMP products would create um, a locally scoped temporary table. Um, and if we used two um, hashes, that would be a global um, temporary table. And, so and the if, difference, sorry, the difference being? So, so with a single hash that we have in, in, in the, the, the bullet on there, it's scoped to the session that you're in. So that table will exist 
while you're executing in the, the session that, that that you're connection connected. that you've opened. Yeah, that connects okay. to SQL Server, but only you will be able to access it. But the next bullet here, which has the, the double hash prefix, will create a global temporary table. So any session will be able to reference that global I temporary see. table. It's not something that has much of a use case scenario these days. So mostly we would use locally scoped temporary tables because if you had a table that you wanted multiple user sessions to be able to access, then you generally create a normal table anyway. Okay. Um, it can be quite difficult to, to troubleshoot and provide, you know, access to global temporary tables. Okay, great. So that's temporary tables. You yeah. said we were going to compare them to table variables. So let's let's look at those. Sure. So table variables were introduced around SQL 7, SQL 2000, something around that, mm -hmm. that kind of time frame. And they were introduced because of the nature of temporary tables. They're basically like normal tables in a normal database. And SQL Server maintains um, what's called a set of statistics, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that in the in the next module. Mm -hmm. um, so statistics are uh, contain data about the distribution of data within the table, and as the data within the table changes, the distribution data changes. Statistics will get automatically updated, and when statistics are updated, it can generate a recompilation of the code that you were using, um, which can then give you a different execution plan. So it can cause performance problems, generally. You're creating a lot of additional work unnecessarily because yeah, the tables are temporary it, it, anyway. Exactly. Okay. So, so then this uh, the concept of a table variable was brought in, which is used similarly to temporary tables, but it's scoped to a batch. So it's scoped to a piece of code that you're running rather than the whole session. Okay. Um, it will make more sense when we have a look at have a look at the demo. Right. But the key thing to, to realize with table variables is that uh, there are no statistics on table variables. So the fact that there are no statistics means that it doesn't changes don't cause recompilations um, of the code using. Um, using those table variables, which can be a good thing if recompilations is a problem. Um, but because the um, on the next bullet, the estimates are always one row, it can be very effective for small data sets. Because if you've got 10 rows and the optimizer estimates one row coming out of that table, then uh, that's fine. But if you've got 100,000 rows, and the optimizer expects one row, that can change the way that, uh, that SQL Server optimizes the, the, the sure. code that you're running. And I, I mean, I guess, if you, to use that example, it's an extreme example, but if, mm. if, if you're designing a database and you've got a, a variable that's going to hold 10,000 rows, then I think there's probably more fundamental problems with your, your database design, I think. Yes, but I mean, we see a lot of, um, Customers that we deal with in uh, when we're troubleshooting and looking at health tech scenarios and the way things have been developed, where things start off small and you start off with 10 rows, and if you've got 10 rows, table vary is actually quite a useful mm. construct of storing temporary data. But two years later, sure. that 10 rows has expanded, it's now 100,000 rows. We've seen scenarios where table variables are great to use and developers just use them everywhere because they seem like they're better than temporary tables. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just that they're, they're kind of different and you need to understand the pros and cons of them both. Um, but in general, table variables um, only use on very small data sets. Okay. And that's because SQL Server doesn't maintain statistics All right. good, uh, on good table tip. variables. So, um, once again, over to your uh, demo machine and let's Great. take a look at these two things. So, for this example, I'm going to use a database called People. Um, I'm going to create a temporary table called People, which has all of these columns in. So, personal ID, first name, last name, date of birth, date of death, and sex. I'm going to populate the table by inserting into hash people. Um, by selecting the top 250 rows, all of the columns from um, a normal table called people. Okay. I 
appreciate that the naming may be a little bit confusing here. Okay. But just basically, remember the hash one as the temporary one. Yes, correct, yeah. So if I have a look at account star from hash people, I have 250 rows. Okay. So what I'm doing here is counting all of the rows within that table. Okay. I have 250 rows in, in hash people. Now, if I... Disconnect this session. Reconnect. And just to be clear, that even though it's the same window, this is now a different session yes, because we've correct, closed the real yeah. connection. So this table name is invalid because we've disconnected and we've come back to the new right. session. Um, and because it's scoped to a session, um, it only existed in the previous right. session. So I'm going to do the same thing with a table variable now. So in order to create a table variable, I'm going to declare a variable of a table type okay, yep. with the same definitions. So I'll do that, and then I'm going to insert the, the same, same code, code basically, yeah. and that failed, and that's because the table variable is scoped to a batch and the batch is what I've highlighted and just executed. I see. Okay. So in order for this to work, I need to declare the variable and, and insert the rows. Oh. Nope. Oh, because I reconnected. I didn't reconnect in the context of the right oh, we're database. Oh, we're in a different database. Insert, I see. Yeah. So now I've got those 250 rows inserted. And if I do a select, it will fail because it's, it's scoped to the batch. Okay. So if I want to work on that table, I have to do everything I want within that single execution. I see. Okay. Okay. And if we have a look at the estimated execution plan, I may be jumping ahead a little bit here. Just, yeah, estimated number of rows there. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we've got the estimated number of rows for the select. Uh, and it's is one. one. Yeah. So yeah. The, when in actual fact, we know that there are 250 rows. And that may not be enough at this scale to, to cause the execution plan to be any different. But you know, as I mentioned before, we've seen situations of hundreds of thousands of rows. Mm -hmm. Um, later on and, and causing this problem here. Oh, okay, great. Thanks for that. Now, common table expressions. This is another way of, uh, of e effectively creating a, a, a table-like structure for me to work with. Yeah. Do you want to talk me through that? So, so basically, a common table expression is a mechanism for defining a subquery that can be used elsewhere in a query. So for this example here, it's a bit like a view that's then referenced within the same code. Okay. So it can be referenced multiple times in the same query with just the one definition. So for this example here, this select statement that we have um, in the middle that's wrapped in that um, with CTE year mm -hmm. is then referenced in the subsequent select statement. Um, and then we would do uh, the, the aggregations with all the distinct and count within that. So, so in effect, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying with that, with that with statement is I want to define for temporary purposes a table-like structure that's named. I'm giving it a, a name that I yeah. can work with, and then I'm going to reference that throughout that the rest of my code. I'm subsequently going to use. And this is it's quite a useful um, construct to, to reduce the amount of lines that you would put in code. It's not really a performance enhancement. Um, but where we get into uh, recursion, that's where you can really get um, uh, the performance enhancements for this. So if I had a table that had uh, the classic example for recursions is employees who have managers who are also employees. Exactly. I can yeah. query through and, and build up a higher or build up an yeah, org chart. Exactly. And this is effect and this is what's coming up in the demo actually. Oh well. On the next slide. Oh there you go. Um, and Agreed, there you go. Yeah. It supports recursion yeah. and there's a demo. So Perfect. let's let's go see the demo. So I'm just going to use the T-SQL database again. We'll create this um, common table expression here that we saw on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. 
let's run that. So what that's giving us is uh, in this first definition, we're selecting um, the year from the order date column as order year uh, and the customer ID from the orders table in the sales schema. Mm -hmm. And then in the second part, we're selecting the order year and we're doing a count of the distinct customer IDs um, from the CT that we've defined up here. Okay. So what we're looking for is the number of distinct customers that placed orders within 2006, 2007, 2008. Okay. Okay. So that's a fairly simple example. Yes, We talked absolutely. about recursion, I guess that's what we're going to say. Yeah, say. so the next one coming up here is this recursive CTE, and this is where the performance benefits of, of CTEs come in. So what we're doing is creating this uh, anchor query is what we call the, the start of the tree. So we're doing this select statement from the employees table okay. where the employee ID equals five. Then we have this union all. And what we're doing is going to recursively go through the CT that we've created based on the employee ID of five um, and then select out um, the that root employee and then everybody that works for them. So in this sense, just to be clear, we know that employee number five is the CEO or managing director at the, the yeah. top of the tree. So we start there and then we recursively go down each level yeah. of the management hierarchy. Yeah, exactly. So if we did a, just a select all of the employees, what we're looking for here is employee ID five, and then we'll recursively go through um, all of the employees that have a manager ID of five, basically. Okay. Let's go ahead and run that. So a recursive CTE is definitely something that um, you should follow up with in terms of preparing for the exam and in, in general. Mm -hmm. Being aware of, of common table expressions in general, but a recursive CTE is really where, you, where you're going to get the, the performance benefits from, from setting this up. So as, as, as my old uh, teacher at school used to say, it would behoove you to learn a little <laughs> bit more about this before sitting the exam. Yes, so absolutely. A little tip. All right, absolutely. great. Let's, um, let's switch across. I think we've got one more uh, major topic to, to talk about on the slides. Yeah. So partition tables is, uh, is a really important area of SQL Server, and it was, very, uh, it was an easy decision to include partition tables in the context of this course mm -hmm. uh, because it's really a, a fundamental performance uh, tuning area for, for within SQL Server. So this example, we have the sales, um, the orders table within the sales schema. Um, we've got multiple file groups here. So we talked about file groups. Mm -hmm. We touched on file groups earlier on. And the idea here is that we are horizontally partitioning the orders table into multiple file groups um, to make uh, managing a large table more efficient. So to be clear here, I mean, previously we talked about creating a table and allocating it to a file group. Yeah. Here we're talking about creating a table and allocating different partitions within that table to, yeah. to different file groups. We're effectively groups. splitting a table across multiple file groups and probably multiple files as well to use it most effectively. Okay. So this is the idea where each partition would be stored in a specific file group. Um, indexes are automatically aligned. So this is a great exam tip here around indexes on partitions. Um, and um, a partition aligned index basically means if I created an index on the orders table, um, it would create indexes for each one of the partitions within the table. Okay, so it, it partitions the index is what, Correct. in alignment with the table. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. So, okay, let's let's talk about how we would go about creating one of these things then. Eh? Yeah, absolutely. So, so these are setting up the partition table. Again, from an exam tip perspective, you really need to understand this concept of a partition function. So this partition function defines the boundary values for partitions. So we would typically um, we would typically partition based on dates is a really good um, uh, typical partitioning scenario. And this boundary values is basically defining in this example we have here. Um, so this is a date, so this is 1st of January 2000. So this first 
uh, value that we have here, and we're basically saying anything um, that this is a boundary value and between um, 1st of January 2000, 1st of January 2001, um, we're going to put them specifically into uh, a partition. So we have in the, in the, the code, um, yeah. a comment code there. Yeah, I, I just want to call out that there's, we've defined three boundary points, and, and if you think about this logically, if you make three cuts in something, you end up with four pieces. Yes. So what, yeah, what, what you do exactly. by defining three um, boundary points is you create four partitions. Yes, yeah. yeah. So we've got everything before 2000, we've got from 2000 to 2001, 2001 to 2002, and anything greater than 2002 okay. as the partition function. And the next part that we would create is a partition scheme. So this effectively maps the file groups um, to partitions. So this is the next stage from the partition function okay. and defines um, a file group for each one of the functions and the next file group that we're going to use. Right, so, so we've, we've initially created a partition function, three boundary points equals four partitions. Yeah. We've created a partition scheme, and we've specified five file groups because there's one for each of those partitions, and then there's one that says, hey, look, if I add some data to this and, and create a new boundary point, I want you to use this. This is the this next is the one that I'm going to use, yeah. Gotcha. And then when, when we create uh, a partitioned table, uh, so in this example, we're creating an orders table. Um, we're creating it on the, um, the partition function. Okay. So yes, yeah, as simple as that, the create table is create the table where previously we had on file group, it's now on the partition function. Correct, yeah. And we're specifying which of the columns in the table is, is the one that we compare to the boundary value. Exactly, yeah. Right, okay, great. So partition function, partition schemes, definitely something that, that you'll need to be um, conversant with for the purpose of the exam. All right, and I guess having you know spread the data across these multiple partitions, that there's one or two cool things I can do to manage them. So why don't you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And again, definitely from an exam perspective, um, you need to be um, familiar with these uh, the different ways you can manage the partitions. Mm -hmm. So the first one that we wanted to talk about is a split partition. So effectively, what we're adding in is a new boundary to split a single partition into two partitions. So we're saying um, in this example here, we're creating, um, uh, so we're saying for a particular date range, we're going to cut it in the middle and we're going to separate those into two partitions. So if I, I mean, the classic example would be from, from previously, we had a table where the last partition contained all of the orders after the 1st of January 2002. Yeah. Now, if we kept that going for 13 months, we're then into 2003. So what we might want to do is insert a split that says, well, exactly. keep the 2002 on one partition and start using the next one for 2003. Exactly. So, and the next uh, managing uh, area is around merge partitions. So this is around removing a boundary to merge two partitions into a single partition. And you may do this for um, consolidation of, of archive data, of older data. So we have this sliding time window that you were mentioning there mm. where We've split the newer partition, so we've now um, we've split 2002, 2003 data. Mm -hmm. 2003 onwards is going on there. But if we look at the other end of this time spectrum, we may then want to merge, uh, in this example here, this kind of um, pre-2000 orders with 2001 orders, for example. Yeah, so, so perhaps I only really care about the, the most recent three years and then everything else before that just gets lumped together. Yeah, on a, on I still archive. need it, but I'm not yeah. worried about optimising the performance of it because all of 90%, 99% of my work is at the front end of the table. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, and finally, switch partitions. So switching partitions is a way for you to switch out. So we have this archive process that we mentioned that we would use maybe merge at the, at the back end of the, of the partition table um, and we could use switch to actually switch a partition out of the table completely um, to put it into a, a different table structure. So and in, in this example is exactly that, an archive staging table. So switching at the old table. So it's worth pointing out that dollar partition function which, which is a way of finding out the 
which of the partitions I want to switch. It's, yes, it's, yeah. Here's the value, find whichever partition this value's in, and that's the one that I want to yeah, switch out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, for the final time in this module, you're, you're up. Perfect, right. So, for this example, I'm going to um, I'll drop DemoDB, because we've been using it previously. I'm just going to create um, a sample uh, database here. I'm going to create a number of data files and file groups here. So a file group, um, I'm going to create a file group called FG0000 and then a file name associated with that file group. And I'm going to go through and create exactly the same thing for the other date ranges that I have in this table. So there's nothing specific to partitioning here. This is just file groups we mentioned right at the, right at the exactly. very beginning of the module. If you haven't worked with file groups before, go and have a look at it. But all we're doing here is creating some file groups and adding files to them. Exactly. So then um, the first thing I'm going to do is to create a partition function. So we have mentioned this uh, before as the first thing to do as range right values. So where I'm saying range right, I'm basically saying how would I deal with a value that was exactly the same as my... So it's on the boundary. Yeah, exactly. So if I had a value for the 1st of January 2000, I would store it in the right-hand partition rather than the left-hand partition. Okay. So I'm going to create a partition function called PF. which has three partitions. Mm -hmm. I'm going to create a partition scheme called PS, um, which has five file groups in, mm -hmm. which aligns to what I've created. Then I'm going to create this table on the partition scheme, which is on this date key, which gives me my partition table. So now I'm going to insert a few rows uh, of varying values to distribute amongst these partitions. Okay. And if we have a look at this um, partition metadata script. We'll I, I guess that. perhaps just to point out, don't worry too much about the syntax. There, there's some deep diving into some system tables to find out what's on what's yeah, partitions here. Exactly. But the point is to look at the results and see how that yeah, data has been Yeah, it, It's just for the purposes of, of demos, basically. So what we can see, if I scroll this up, it's showing us the partition scheme, the function, the partition number, and the number of rows in each partition. So based on the rows that we input, um, it's distributing them amongst uh, partitions two and three. So yeah, based on the, the, uh, the order date key, it's there have been two orders that were placed between 2000 yeah, and 2001 there, like yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, which matches well. Yeah, great. Yeah, perfect. So this one was on the, the boundary. So it's and it's range right, so it's second. gone to the second one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the next thing we're going to do is this split. So what we're going to do is to split, because we've got our last partition is for 2002 onwards. 2002 it, yeah. onwards, yeah. So we're going to split that. Have a look at the partition metadata again. Um, so we've now got a new um, partition in one of the uh, file groups that we created in the beginning. So we defined all the file groups to begin with. And it was specifically that last file group that we, we added when we created the partition scheme. We said, take the partitions from this function, put them on these file groups, and set aside this, this final one to be the next used exactly. one. And that's the one yeah. that's used. Yeah. Okay. So the next one, we're going to merge ranges. So what we're going to do is to merge. Uh, so this partition here, partitions one and two, because we're saying I'm not really interested in separating out data between 2000 and 2001. I just want it to be merged into in, into uh, history, basically. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. And if we have a look at this um, partition scheme data again, we can see that that's been merged and everything prior to 1st of January 2001 would now be in the first partition. And, and the FG2000 file group is, is no longer used in this partition table. It's, it's freed up, exactly. nothing on it. Yeah, Exactly. And then finally, um, I'm going to create a separate archive staging table. 
and I'm going to switch out all of this pre um, this 2000 data mm -hmm. into the archive staging to staging table. So that's the, the the table you just created. We've moved effectively. We've swapped the partition with that table across. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So if we have a look at the construct of the partition table again, it's still there, yeah. but so, there's no rows in it. Yeah. So we've moved those those rows out to an archive table. Okay. I guess just one final point to make about that. The reason we were able to switch between a partition and the table, they were both on the same file group. Correct, yeah. So if we go back and have a look at that definition there. Um, slightly before that, I think. Yeah. yeah. It, it was specifically created out on the file group. There. And again, with, without giving anything away, if, if you're preparing for the exam, be aware that if you are switching between a partition table and either another partition table or just a regular table, they have to be on the same file group for that switch yeah, to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So partitioning, and again, it's, it's difficult to do it justice in such a short sure. session, but um, suffice to say that it's definitely an area that you should get some hands-on practice with and be familiar with these concepts of the order in which to, to set up partition table mm -hmm. and, and also to manage it with, um, with switch and merge. Fantastic. All right, let's, let's close off and uh, finish over on the slides. And it's been quite a long module. We've, well, we spent some time at the beginning just introducing the whole course, and then we've, we've covered a lot of ground here. We covered tables and some of the considerations for designing tables, thinking about your data types, your, your column names, uh, all of that kind of good stuff. Schemas and the idea that it's, it's a naming boundary and, and getting used to the idea of using that two-part naming um, uh, approach when you're... Uh, when you're accessing your tables or when you're working with tables or, or any objects, really. Uh, we talked about views. We talked about the idea of that being a kind of virtual table um, that is the, the metadata for that view is permanently stored as part of the database, so they're always available for you to query. And the abstract, they provide an abstraction layer over the, the underlying tables. And then we compare temporary tables and table variables. Uh, temporary tables exist in the tempdb database and they are automatically deleted at the end of the, the session if they're, they're local um, or when the, the, uh, the server is restarted or the, the tempdb is reinitialized um, if they're, they're global ones. Uh, table variables we talked about, and, and I think the, the point you made there was they're great for small batches of data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you start having table variables that have got huge numbers of rows, you might want to think about approaching that yeah. slightly differently. Common table expressions, a way of, of effectively inline defining a table structure and then using that repeatedly um, in your code. And one of the real benefits of CTEs was the fact that they're a great way to implement recursion. So you, you anchor the top level thing that you want to query in a CTE and then you can recursively um, you know, build out each, each level underneath that. And then finally, uh, partition tables. And as you said, it's a, it's a really key um, component in, in optimizing the performance and, and, and the manageability of a, a SQL Server database and a real key thing to, to prepare for the exam. So lots and lots of things that we've covered in this module. I hope you've uh, found that useful. Um, go and give yourself a shake, have a cup of coffee and, and make sure that you're, uh, you're uh, comfortable with everything we've covered so far and then come back and join us for the, the next module when we'll start looking at indexes. <laughs>